Are you going first? I am. I'm usually looking at that side. That's fine. Good morning. Good morning, Your Honors. May it please the Court, Stephen Gagne for the Commonwealth. I'd like to thank Your Honors, first off, for accepting this case for further appellate review. What's concerning to the Commonwealth in this case, given the Appeals Court decision, is that it has the potential to raise the requirements for prosecutors not only in the already busy Superior Courts but in the burgeoning District Courts of what steps can reasonably be expected to be taken to locate and procure and produce a witness to testify at trial. Um, I, I understand that's the primary issue with which you're concerned, but I have a question about the facts before you get to that and we get all involved with that. Could you just tell me exactly what was said by the victim witness at the probable cause hearing that was later admitted into court um, without his presence? What was the statement that he said at the probable cause hearing that was admitted in court? The statement? Well, at, at the trial itself in the Superior Court. The probable cause testimony was admitted. I know yes. that, but what was the exact wording of the testimony that was admitted? What, what did Mario say? What did he say? Well, that's the issue. What did he say at the probable cause hearing? I, I, maybe I missed it in the briefs, or, but exactly what did he say at the probable <coughs> cause hearing that was admitted at the Superior Court trial? Actually, the testimony as it appears in the, in the transcript from the Superior yeah, Court trial I haven't trial read the transcript yet. Is yet word for word what he said at the probable cause Right, hearing. but what is that? We don't have that yet. We don't have it. Justice I Howard, haven't read just the asking transcript you to, yet. She hasn't read the transcript. I'm sorry, the, the transcript from the Superior Court trial yes. had a, an employee of our office reading Mario's testimony. Right, yes. but what and did he, he say? said yeah. that he was at a bar uh, on the evening in question. He was drinking. Yeah, what did he say as far as the identification? That's all I want to know. At, at the Superior Court trial, it was read to the jury that he identified in court the defendant as the person who had beaten him up. And also, there was testimony later from an, an officer, Encarnacio, that... No, it couldn't have been that he identified in court because if there's, there's a police officer standing up there reading the testimony, saying, I'm Mario, this well, is what I said. What did he say Mario said? Well, that, well that's... In terms of the in-court identification, that's a tricky question because... Yeah, that's why I'm asking at, you. At the Superior Court trial, we have a fill-in for Mario. Right, and but he's reading the probable reading, cause. What did it say? It said that the person who beat me up is sitting there. And thank of course, the you. defendant was present yeah. at the The district the court testimony. Court. Yes. Okay, was, thank you. Yes, so it, it's, it, we're essentially okay, reading to the jury an identification from the probable cause mm -hmm. hearing, but we don't have the victim witness advocate. I understand, but those are the words that he said. Okay, yes. that answers yes. my question. Thank you. I apologize for yes. the, the, the yeah. confusion on that, but... We do have uh, an employee of our office reading his transcript from the probable cause hearing where Mario himself appeared in person, was cross-examined at length by the defense attorney. Right. And unfortunately, by the time the trial arrives, which is close to a year after the date of the incident, Mario can no longer be located. So the appeals court says that the uh, failure on the part of the Commonwealth really was in that it waited uh, until the eve of trial to uh, reach out to his brother. I strongly disagree with that. The Commonwealth's affidavits and the affidavit from Trooper West states that several months or early 2005, the Commonwealth enlisted the help of the Massachusetts State Police. Yes, but un unfortunately you didn't, I mean, it, it may be enough, it may not be enough, but unfortunately you didn't provide precise dates except for that early in 05 you contacted the state police, but there are not precise dates as to when the state police went to Mario's address in New Bedford, or last known address, or the dates that they went to Francisco's address in Rhode Island. Yes, the trooper's affidavit, the Commonwealth's affidavit. Devoid of dates. Of not specific dates. specific dates, I admit that. Yeah. However, when you look at the entire record and note that the final pretrial conference was held in March of 2005, which is typically when trial dates are set, you can infer at least that March or April being early 2005, I don't think anyone yeah, would but there's nothing in the record that says that, that you know, we usually don't set the dates until the pretrial date or we don't know before that. Um, we just I, have to sort of infer that. I'm just making that. Knowledge. I'm just yeah. making that observation, making yeah. that point based upon my own experience in the Superior Court. 
but that's typically when a trial date is chosen. Hopefully that is the trial date that actually occurs. Mr. Gagne, I, forgive me, uh, because I may not have remembered all the dates. In June, you filed, the Commonwealth filed um, its motion in limine seeking to introduce, um, you know, his testimony from the probable cause hearing. Um, is there something that will tell us how much before that time the Commonwealth became aware that it couldn't locate him? Well, we, we have the statement in early 2005. No, no, I understand right. that. So now we're down, now, now we're in June, right? Yes. So um, um, do we know how, how, when the Commonwealth first realized that they had a problem on their hands? Well, I would say that um, there's no precise date when the Commonwealth finally said, it looks like we're not going to have Mario. And, and on that point, the Commonwealth's efforts were continuing up of until course, the of trial course, date. Of we, course. We wouldn't no, no, of course you don't stop, but right, you're, just, you're giving advance notice to the, to the defendant, uh, most important, but also to, uh, to the trial judge. Yes, and, and had the Commonwealth realized prior to trial that Mario was, for example, dead or, or no, no, permanently course, unavailable, sure. We wouldn't have waited until the day of trial to file Could this motion. Could you have motion. asked for a, a brief continuance the day of the trial to try to, what, because you had just recently learned that he was at least in New Jersey, so that you could have, say, contacted the New Jersey State Police to, to run some records to try to locate him in New Jersey? Well, I'm glad you raised that point, because had the trial judge, in her discretion, denied the Commonwealth's motion in limine, that's most likely what the Commonwealth would have been forced to do. No, but I'm saying put the shoe on the other foot. Could you not have requested a brief continuance once you learned that he was in New Jersey to take some steps within that state? Well, we could have, but we relied upon the trial judge's ruling that we had made a sufficient effort to that point. Now, obviously, if that ruling had gone the other way and we'd gotten or requested a continuance, we would have been forced to yeah, make further efforts. But why couldn't you have done that anyway? I mean, it's not very hard. It's just a phone call to not some New Jersey um, state police authority you know, run some records there, or even today with the, int with the um, computer, you can run some records there. Somebody can see if he's used a credit card in New Jersey, see if he's got a, a license in New Jersey. I'm agreeing that in the end he probably wouldn't have come back because the, he know, he's um, in default on the other cases, but simply to strengthen your hand. I'm not so sure that with a name and a date of birth, particularly an, uh, an undistinguishable name such as Mario Perez, in the state of New Jersey with its population and geographic size, that that would have necessarily been fruitful. You never Mr. know. Mr. Gagney, the, the piece that, that I am interested in um, is the uh, conversations with um, Francisco, uh, the brother, because it seems that, uh, I, I think that, you know, whether it was done, at least from my point of view, whether it was done by the state, by the state police or anybody else, you know, you have somebody going several <coughs> times, asking neighbors, showing a photograph. I mean, that's a pretty uh, serious attempt to locate somebody, assuming that that's the only information you have as to his whereabouts. Um, uh, but as I understand it, um, Francisco appears, um, and that morning the Commonwealth speaks to him. Was it not possible for the Commonwealth to speak to Francisco beforehand? I mean, that seems to me to where you would next go is to a known relative. Well, we discover that Francisco has that outstanding case of his own in district court, which happened to have a court date the week before the defendant's trial. Right. I, in this case, being the trial prosecutor, arranged to have him served in hand in the district court. Right. I myself was not there. and for reasons not in the record, could not be there that day. That's fine. I mean, you, 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 you but, took but the precautions you, to do that. But yeah. it, it seems that back in, I, I think it was April, I could be wrong, um, you knew that the car was registered to an, um, uh, I think to him, to an address in Rhode Island, correct? Yes. And I think there's the, an affidavit that the trooper went to Rhode Island and knocked and did things and showed pictures of Mario. Never showed pictures of Francisco, though. I mean, no, I, I'm not, did, not, did not show pictures of Francisco, but knocked on Francisco's door itself. There was noise, but... There was music that could be heard playing inside, no response, either, any time the trooper went there. It's also, you have Francisco's vehicle being found at an address in New Bedford, 
yet despite his vehicle being there, no one's ever answering the door there. Also, mail being sent to that address in Mario Perez's name, being returned as not known at this address. Now, if that was one of Mar one of Francisco's... No, I, I'm, I'm on Francisco, not... Yeah, I mean, I'm sort of... But yeah. it, it, I would suggest it ties into Francisco because if he's... If he has a, both a New Bedford address and a, and a Providence address, no one's answering the door despite his vehicle being in the, New Bedford. The police went there, excuse me, with a picture of Mario, but did the, did the police have a picture of Francisco, or could they have gotten a picture of him? I would assume they could have gotten they one. They never went to, at least from what's in your brief, they, I understand, as I understand it, they never went to the Rhode Island address with a picture of Francisco. No, they did not. No. no they, they, well, that, since that was his address, it would seem to me that was the logical thing to do. I mean, taking a picture of Mario is, is okay, but it would seem to me to take a picture with them of Francisco would have been a lot better since that's where he lived, not Mario. Well, I'd suggest that, that they were starting with the victim himself, focusing their efforts on I him. I know, but as long as you're going to people, you can take two pictures as well as one in your hand at the same time. They could have. And, and if they had reached Francisco earlier in the process, I would suggest that still that the indications are that that would not have been fruitful either. Why? Because he was speaking to the victim witness once or twice a week, and maybe he could have gotten um, a telephone um, number somehow. I mean, there are enough ways to get numbers when people call you these days. Or well, he could have been in the presence of a, of a state police officer when he received the call, something like that. You have to look, I'd suggest, at what Francisco said he knew about his brother's whereabouts. He states that he didn't know when Mario had moved to New Jersey. He didn't know where in New Jersey Mario had moved to. He claimed to have no telephone number, no address for Mario. Okay, first of all, this is what he says, number yes. one. It's not necessarily the truth. And number two, even assuming that what he says is the truth, he did get calls from him once or twice a week. Well, he did make the, most That's of those statements under oath. Okay, so I'm saying, so, so assuming what he says is the truth, then what, at least once or twice a week he's getting calls from him. That's we what also, he says. And we also have mail being sent to an address where he parks his car, Francisco in New Bedford, being returned not known at this address. It's, and given also Mario's two outstanding warrants, I question whether or not Francisco was truly motivated to assist the Commonwealth in this case to find Mario. Certainly. It was mentioned in the Commonwealth's opening at trial that both Mario and Francisco were members of the Guatemalan community in the city of New Bedford. And this case just illustrates the realities on the ground every day that it's not always that easy to find and procure the cooperation of witnesses in these cases, particularly where sometimes they are openly hostile to the Commonwealth or they're transient or they're just not interested in cooperating. Here, I, I just, I'm not aware of any other case to date in the Commonwealth where such efforts were made yet still uh, were held to be insufficient. In almost Mr. any case... Mr. Gagnon, excuse me for interrupting yes. you. Could I ask you this? It, it cannot be infrequent that um, um, people, particularly <coughs> in circumstances such as this, move out of state. <coughs> Correct? Correct. Um, at the time the judge made her decision, she did not know that Mario was out of state, correct? Am I correct? Or had, had she you, did. She, she did. had your she, affidavit. She, she had, had your second this, affidavit. Yes, a supplemental affidavit after speaking to Francisco. Mm. I, I realize that this is not in the record, but, but, but summonsing and, obtain, and getting somebody back into um, Massachusetts um, is not that easy. No. Right? I mean, it, it simply isn't that easy. So to what extent, and again, I haven't read the trial transcript. I mean, this is a very experienced Superior Court judge. Yes. To what extent did she take into account the fact that instead of saying, well, he's somewhere in Lowell or somewhere in, um, you know, Worcester or Springfield, that he's somewhere in New Jersey? I know that she, she did state that she had reviewed the affidavits submitted right. by the Commonwealth and by the trooper. And in that affidavit, it clearly states that, according to the brother, he's moved to New Jersey. I don't believe the trial judge, in stating her reasons on the record, specifically mentioned the fact that he lives out of state, but she did mention the fact that he had two outstanding warrants. And in her view, that decreased the likelihood that he was going to voluntarily yeah. come back to the state. What would he, he, have had to he wouldn't do voluntarily. I mean, it's highly unlikely that he right? That's our point. What would you have had to do um, to have proceeded under the Uniform Act to secure the attendance of witnesses? 
first and foremost, we would have had to know where in New Jersey he was, get him served, get him to a hearing in New Jersey. So now we're getting him to show up to a different hearing before he even shows up in New Bedford. So get him served, get him to court in New Jersey, get an order to have him directed to New Bedford, and then hope that he complies with that order and shows up. Yeah, but, but that procedure is there for just that purpose. It is if you know where someone is, if, but, you, but, if you can get them served. I, it, it has to start with getting a piece of paper into Mario's hand in New Jersey. <laughs> so is, the, is the burden, is your burden less when <coughs> you have information that somebody is out of state for purposes of locating the person? N not, not if you have more specific information than we had but here. But you have Francisco, his brother is communicating with him by telephone twice a week. He says that Mario calls him using a friend's phone sometimes twice a week, was his quote on cross-examination. And in other cases where witnesses have been out of state, for example, the Hunt case, we, they knew the witness was in <coughs> England but just simply didn't want to come back. In the Florick case, there was an address known for the person in Kentucky, yet all the Commonwealth did was send mail or send summonses. Or in, even in um, the Celine case, you have at least the Dallas area being specified, or in the Roberio case, you have a particular bar in the state of Fall River, excuse me, in the state of Florida. They then enlisted the help of the Florida State Police to basically stake out that bar. But here we had nothing more than New Jersey. Do, do you agree that the, the record doesn't give us uh, much information about the, the dates on which the Commonwealth made its efforts? The appeals court, uh, says uh, a, a number of times that the, the, the date of that service is missing, as is the date of the record examination that resulted in the information. There's no explanation of why uh, there were no earlier efforts to inquire of Francisco. It says no dates were provided to the judge for any of the Commonwealth's activities that were asserted to show a good faith and diligent search for Mario, I'm reading from footnote three, uh, that last uh, quote. No more precise date was given. Furthermore, unless we specify to the contrary, no dates were provided to the judge. That is a problem, isn't it? Your Honor, I see my time's expired. If I could just address that point. Yes, of course. I, I would admit that the affidavits are not specific in terms of when the trooper went each time or precisely how many times. But when you read the entire record with a final pretrial conference occurring in March and the affidavit saying the efforts began in early 2005, I would, I would not suggest it's reasonable to think that early 2005 means May or June, that it, it's more reasonably interpreted as March and April. And not only the time. Why isn't it January or February? <laughs> because the hearing was in. Uh... Just simply on the fact that the trial date although not specifically clear from the record, was most likely not known until the final pretrial conference date in March. Well, what if the judge did not grant your motion in limine, or however you styled the motion, to use the transcript, and you, you then would have had to file a motion for a continuance, I believe you said. Yes. What would you have done Well, to, lo to, to locate the man? It's, it's not our argument that there weren't any other steps available or that the Commonwealth's effort was exhaustive. No, your argument is that it was reasonable. That under it was the case, reasonable, it was, reasonable. It was sufficiently diligent, and that that's the standard. But what else would you have done? Well, give, we, would, we would take a name and perhaps a date of birth um, and reached out to some authorities in New Jersey to see now, what, that if anything, simple? could be I mean, done. I, I'm not saying you didn't do enough, and under the cases it may well be that this was reasonable, but isn't it really simple to take a name and date of birth and give it to some authorities in New Jersey? It's just a, one telephone call. It seems easy in theory, and all I can say yeah, is that by experience, easy. help, uh, particularly out of state, is, is often not just a phone call away. If we could have started, we could have launched another phase of the search for Mario in New Jersey, how long that would have taken and what the results would have been, I don't know. But we brought this to the trial judge's attention. In her discretion, she allowed us to proceed. And now, almost four years after the date of incident, we're faced with the prospect of a new trial on this case. Mr. Gagne, um, were there any other um, eyewitness identifications? Yes, Fran Francisco testified in the Superior Court and he identified the defendant sitting in so, court. So in answer to Justice Spina's question, could <coughs> the Commonwealth have proceeded uh, without uh, Mario? 
Well, well no, and my question was, was what... No, 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 I understand, but I'm just yeah. saying an answer to that. If you had no. lost... I mean, no, because you, would you have... Oh, I suppose I, could Francisco testify to the attack? Yes, I, think, I, I don't think Francisco saw a wallet being taken, though, so we could have proceeded on an assault and battery, but probably would not have sustained the robbery conviction. Okay. okay. I, I have one other question. <coughs> I, it's not in the record, and it's probably not relevant, but what happened to the co-defendant in this case? Was he tried? The co-defendant, Angel Marcial, had pled guilty prior yes. to this trial. Okay. He actually came in and testified for the defendant in this case, but right. the jury apparently right. rejected his testimony. Also, mm -hmm. identification wasn't an issue in this case. The defendant testified. He admitted. Well, you said that in your brief, but if, if the defense was that, <coughs> was that this defendant <coughs> attacked the victim at another time, not in this beating, doesn't that make identification a defense? No, really. The defense was that uh, the defendant claimed he had gotten into a fight and gotten the better half of that fight with the victim. And apparently afterwards, coincidentally, he then got mugged by Angel Marcial. So there was never really a question as far as who did the beating. Uh, the defendant admitted being in a fight, a one-sided fight with the victim. So it really wasn't identification. It was whether or not the two defendants were working together and whether or not this defendant had any participation in the robbery. Thank you, Mr. Gagney. Thank you very much. Ms. Doherty. <coughs> May it please the court, Elizabeth Doherty. I represent the defendant, Robert Robinson, in this case. Ms. Doherty, let, we, me tell you, let me tell you what my concern is right off the bat. The appeals court perfectly appropriately goes through, you know, it has a nice little heading that says standard of review, and it got, lists the cases. And then, it, as far as I can say, it, it says, you know, we just don't agree with the trial judge. I mean, it's, it's putting itself in the position of the trial judge. There's no deference to the trial judge. Well, the, I would submit that the, uh, that the appeals court was finding that the evidence that was uh, produced at, at the motion to eliminate was not sufficient. And so, therefore, the trial judge's determination was, was incorrect. So not sufficient as a matter of law? The, it, not it sufficient to as messed. to establish reasonable efforts. So it's not sufficient as a matter of law. So has the judge be. made an error of law yes. in her ruling? Yes. But the appeals yes. court really didn't, I don't think, satisfactorily distinguish the past cases which have held a uh, reasonable basis on much, in my opinion, much less than you had here. The, um, the appeals court said that uh, influential in any sort of search for uh, a, uh, you know, a missing witness is an inquiry of employers, family members, uh, How do you make, find out who this man's employer is? He isn't living here. You, no, no, it, it, the employer would not be. be I was and just, family members aren't going to give somebody up who's facing arrest on a default warrant. Family members might have provided some oh. information, and I would submit that with respect to the default, <coughs> the default which uh, the Commonwealth cited as as very probative and his not not uh, come showing up. Had they wanted to have, have him there, as I believe another member of the panel suggested, the Uniform Act was available, and there would have been time to do that. So yeah, but where was he? Francis, didn't, Francis, when, didn't they ask Francisco questions about where he was, and Francisco said he didn't know? Francisco he, said that he, I would say, he said that he was in New Jersey, and he said that he caught, I, I, would, I would sort of step aside for a moment and suggest that um, in the transcript, the, Francisco, English was not his first language, and I would suggest that there, were, there was some confusion as to some of his answers and, and whatnot, but be that as it may, um, Francisco said that, as, as had been suggested already, uh, he called him regularly. He called, sometimes they called each other twice a week. Um, he had called him as early as the week before. He could have, the, the Commonwealth could have So Francisco asked, had the telephone number where Mario could be reached. The, the, the Commonwealth, through technolo technological advances that today, it's very easy to at least It is get not very easy. It is not very easy. We, I mean, first of all, there's cell phones. You may have the telephone number of a friend. You, you're going to ask an, another state authority to send somebody to go and interview that friend. <coughs> they arrive at the door. They say, I'm the New Jersey <coughs> police. The, uh, where's Mario? I haven't seen Mario in six weeks. I would suggest that the Commonwealth could have requested, as I suggested in the brief, <coughs> the, 
the Commonwealth should have requested him to, I believe, for an individual they could do star six nine or star doesn't five. Doesn't come doesn't come back half the time. Sometimes oh, it doesn't, but theory, sometimes it, it is. Yes, but let's assume that you get a telephone number in New Jersey. With a telephone number that would give you an address at the best. And then you have to get another state to agree to take one of its overworked, limited resources to go out and interview somebody who's not, who may not even be the witness that you're looking for because what you know from the Commonwealth's point of view is you know, he c makes calls from friends' homes. This is not unusual. Well, certainly this, this state in the past has, has, had that, has had that happen. They have sent Do you have any, have, can you cite any case in which the Commonwealth has been held to do more than the Commonwealth did in this case? Certainly. Um, Commonwealth versus, versus um, Senna, uh, in which they, uh, the Commonwealth, four, four days, the week before the trial, they sent them down to Puerto Rico, where they, they searched for them there. Commonwealth versus Salim, where they went down to, that went to Texas. Commonwealth versus Roberio, where they no, went the, to Florida. No, the, but these, these cases didn't hold that the Commonwealth must do more or it would be insufficient. No, those, those cases were held to be sufficient they what were they sufficient, did. And I but would say that's a different question than what I, I asked. I would say that, that, that in those instances, they, they, they did more than was they done in this They did more, case. I they know, but I'm asking you, do you have any authority? In other words, is there any case in which it was held insufficient when the Commonwealth did either this much or more? Well, I would suggest that Commonwealth versus Florek, where it was held insufficient, they, they sent letters to the address that they had and they returned just as they were here. I would suggest that the Commonwealth's, the Commonwealth's uh, search for Mario in this state may well, may well have been sufficient. The, the problem arises is that when they get the new information that he might be in New Jersey, they did not even try. They didn't try any, any, any measures at all. And to sacrifice the constitutional right of, of cross-examination and live testimony. So you want us to develop a rule that would say that it's insufficient, efforts of the Commonwealth to seek a, a witness who's missing are insufficient and the witness cannot be declared unavailable when the witness is out of state, unless the Commonwealth makes serious efforts out of state to they get that. They made That's no, a pretty tough rule. They made no efforts in this state. And I would submit that in this, in this instance, it would not have been difficult for them to do so. The, the record suggests, the record reveals that although they said that they were unable to reach uh, Francisco, the district court in New Bedford was. <coughs> they were able to notify him of his pending case. This happened almost a week before the trial date, and it would have been extremely simple. How did they notify him? Excuse me? How did they notify him? I believe him? they notified him by mail. No, it's service in hand, I it's think I heard. I, I, I'm not sure. Well, it the, makes a big difference. Yeah. Excuse me? It makes a big difference. Yes, I, 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 I'm not sure. Normally, wouldn't the summons, just, uh, something just go out from the court, a mail letter go out from the court? From, I, that's that's yes. what I believe. I, I could be wrong on that on that account, but he wa he was summoned in hand at at the, when he showed up for his district court case, on that date, which took place on the Wednesday before the trial date. At that time, someone could have asked Francisco, "Where is your brother?" He, they could have he could have said, "Gee, he's a, he's moved to New, to New Jersey." They, well, they did, and that's what I they were told. They, they did not do that on the Wednesday before trial. At that date, when, when, when they showed up, when the Commonwealth showed up to serve him in hand, at, when he showed up for his district court date, the record, the transcript reveals that a police officer was there and a representative of the district attorney's office was there to serve him in hand so that he would show up for the, the defendant's court case. Mr. At that yeah, excuse me. Uh, Ms. Doherty, um, obviously there's this case and then there's um, future cases. Um, I, I understand that, you're, that you've said one with respect to w what the Commonwealth <coughs> did inside Massachusetts was sufficient. I think I heard you say that just a few minutes ago, correct? Uh, it, it, it see, it not with respect to Francisco. It, it, it does seem that they were not able to find. Uh, they were not able to find Fine. Mari when they made some efforts for that. 
And then what you have fairly shortly before trial is information, reasonably credible information that comes from a brother, um, that he is in a particular other state and not, not he's traveling or he's out of state or he's left the country or he's in New Jersey. If we were to fashion a rule that the Commonwealth then has some obligation to make an inquiry, what is the extent of the inquiry that you would say is legally required, that is, is required as a matter of law that the Commonwealth must undertake in those circumstances? When, once they get the new information? Well, they, they, would, they would certainly, I guess, they would have to be reasonable efforts based on that new information. Uh, you know, th that, I, I would suggest that it, it's in, in Commonwealth versus Siegfried quite some time ago, um, you know, and in the brief I suggest that, that this gives a, you know, gives a scenario that, that could, could take place. At that time when the, when the information came, came before the trial judge, the trial judge said, I would like you to go back and try a number of, a number of other measures. She, she, he or she gave a continuance and asked them to have other measures. The same instance based on the new information. Did the defendant, I know it's not your burden, did the defendant argue that when uh, the judge was considering this issue, the motion in limine? The defendant did state in the transcript, uh, I believe he said, when, when the information came that he was uh, in New Jersey, he said, well, perhaps they could contact the authorities in New Jersey. Um, but, but I, I have a question on another subject, please. Um, at the probable cause hearing, um, did, I know the defendant had the opportunity to cross-examine Mario. Did the defendant um, extensively or briefly, or how would you characterize the cross-examination? I have not read the transcript. I guess I would uh, cr cr uh, classify it as not perhaps as aggressive. But uh, he did. He did. He did cross-examine him. But I, you know, uh, I wouldn't say extensively or aggressively. Did the, the, did the defendant request the, the probable cause? <coughs> I'm not sure. Um, Do we have a transcript <coughs> of both the probable cause hearing and the hearing, the superior court hearing? Well, the um, the probable cause testimony, as uh, Mr. Gagney has stated, it was read uh, in, in, total it, it was uh, read in course, totality. In totality? Yes. Okay, so yeah. we have it all. Um, so, so yes, you have the whole. Um, well, we, no, 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 no. We, we couldn't. Uh, well, the, maybe the, well, the examination, the cross-examination, yes. Yeah. Uh, as, to, as, to, as to Mario's, Mario's testimony, so yes. So the cross-examination was there. Yes, the cross-examination was, was there. They had, they had, an, they had an, another member of the uh, district attorney's office uh, sort of play. Did, played. did the, um, um, could we get to the other issue for a second? Both edition? Yeah. yeah. Um, in the cross, in the part of the um, probable cause that was read was the, prior identification that is running up to the police or if that's what happened was that part of of what mario testified to the the uh the state um uh, do you know i'm, I'm not yeah, being very no, clear I, I, do you know what i mean yes i think i do i i think you may be referring to uh, officer and, and acarcio's uh testimony i don't believe that was in the probable cause testimony i think the probable cause testimony was was mario uh Right, but I mean, was Mario asked at the probable cause hearing about had he made an identification before? Did he run up to the police? Did he say anything? I, I'm not sure as, as whether that's whether that's the case. Okay. I I want to say I think not, but I okay I think, okay. Uh, but the police officer testified in court to this um, allegedly spontaneous excited utterance um, when Mario said that those are the guys. The two guys, yes. Okay. Uh, um, I, I would argue that, that, that that's inadmissible on, an, on a number of counts. I'd, I'd, argue it's, I'd argue that it's inadmissible under Crawford um, in that he's, he's unavailable. I'd also argue that it, if, if not that, that it was not admissible as a spontaneous uh, ex exclamation. Uh, under King. Under King. Uh, given that, um, that the trial judge's um, inquiry of, as to his uh, competency as a, as a witness based on extensive evidence. Well, isn't that something for the jury, whether he was intoxicated to the extent that he was unable to make an identification at that point? Isn't that really a jury question? Well, I mean, they would not, they wouldn't have, they, 
a lot of this, it, it comes in, into, into a problem because there's, he's, he's not there for the jury to make observations of, his, of his, his demeanor, the way that he testifies and whatnot. But that's um, true in any, in any excited, <coughs> spontaneous utterance situation. Yeah, I, I would say that, 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 the, no. that the trial judge erred in, uh, in, in determining, determining him competent <coughs> based on the extensive evidence that was But there. I take it you, you would concede that this out-of-court identification would come in if Mario was testifying? It, it The police what, officer saying that the victim here. If Mario was there. Yeah, if, if Mario uh, was testifying. Um, why? The prior identification would come in. Through the oh, officer, officer? Yes. In, in, well, on those grounds, yes. I mean, I would still argue that it, that it, w it would not be. If he. W you would it, say it wasn't, it wasn't um, reliable because he was intoxicated, but it yes. would, there would be no Crawford issue if he was no, there. No, if, if he were available, there would be no Crawford issue. That's right. For the well, police officer to testify that Mario came up and said, this is the man. There would, be, there would be not be a Crawford issue. Okay. Okay. Was, was he being brought to the scene for a one-on-one -on -one show up? No, I don't believe he was. Um, although, is why, it, why is it testimonial? Oh, uh, why is it testimonial under Crawford? Yeah, I would argue that it would be testimonial, uh, not per se, but in in fact, because he was there was a police officer there. He was stating to the police officer at that time, "That's the guy." A reasonable person, um, even a reasonable intoxicated person, would would have perceived that a statement to a police officer, a statement of identification. I believe I state some cases in the in my brief that that would have been that would have been a statement that would be used at a, a, a trial. He wasn't a child. He was, I mean, he was an adult. It, under, it would be con constituted. Uh, con but, what if you, we, what, but what if we were to say that the exciting event was seeing him come out of the building, not the um, prior <coughs> incident? <coughs> what if we were to say, what if one were to say that the exciting event was, or the event, was the, the um, Defendants being escorted from the building, not the prior attack. I believe there, w there was no, um, the, again, the same problems that would result from the trial judge's um, determination of spontaneous uh, utterance on the, on, because of his intoxication. There were no findings of fact on that. There were no findings surrounding the, uh, to make that finding. It wouldn't, it wouldn't have been, there wasn't an, it weren't fi findings before her. So I would submit that that's not sufficient on that. Thank you, Mr. Arity.